Welcome everyone. Uh, today we'll be exploring the environmental impact of the European Union's consumption patterns, focusing on emissions not just within its borders, but also those outsourced globally. I'm very glad to uh, be your moderator for today's event, which is hosted by the Stockholm Environment Institute. We are an international nonprofit research and policy organization that tackles environmental and development challenges. Uh, we also have the support of the European Climate Foundation for this event. Understanding the EU's carbon footprint is crucial for addressing the global challenge of climate change because it highlights emissions that the EU is responsible for, yet are less visible and often neglected in traditional metrics. Today, we're launching a report and a brief that aim to shed light on these hidden impacts, emphasizing the importance of addressing all sources of emissions to meet global climate goals. We'll hear from report authors on some main findings and recommendations that could be taken forward by the EU and its member states. We're very glad to also have a panel featuring representatives from the European Parliament and also from national climate policy councils from three EU member states that we study in the report, Denmark, France and Sweden. The councils in their own national context play an important role to evaluate and guide national climate policies and ensure that each country remains on track to meet climate targets. So by analyzing effective strategies, they help to drive national goals and it also has important implications at the EU level. We're also uh, privileged to jo be joined by a member of the European Parliament to bring a lawmaker's perspective to our discussion about how EU can take collective action. So I'd like to take you through uh, some important uh, points about today's webinar before we dive in. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and uh, shown live on uh, LinkedIn and will be available afterwards for participants. You could go to the next slide, please. So uh, as a participant in the webinar, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom app. So when you enter a question, you can state your name and affiliation. And uh, if you would like to direct it to a particular speaker, please indicate that in your question. There's also the possibility to engage with uh, the discussion via X, and you can see the SEI handle at SEI Climate and also via LinkedIn. So we will begin today with a presentation of report findings by two of the report authors, and then we'll be moving towards a panel discussion with our guests from the European Parliament and Climate Councils. And then we'll turn to an open discussion where all panelists and presenters will be available to answer your questions. And we'll conclude following that. So let me now introduce our uh, report authors. So uh, as I mentioned, we're launching a report and brief, and this is the culmination of a research project by the Stockholm Environment Institute with contributions by Carbon4. Today, we'll have a presentation of the findings and recommendations by two of the report authors, Katarina Axelsson and Yin Dan Gong. So I'd like to now hand the floor to Katarina to uh, take us through. Thank you, Tim, and I hope you all can hear me all right. Um, I'm happy to uh, present for you today some of the conclusions from, from our report. And uh, I wanted, sorry, it's lagging here a bit. Here we go. I wanted to start us off from this slide, which shows that despite the climate urgency we all know that we are in, that the greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase at the global level. This trend is, as you can see here, driven by several different types of greenhouse gas emissions, the most important being carbon dioxide, which is responsible for about 70% of the 
total emissions at the global level, but then also another 30% connected to other gases such as methane and nitrous oxide gases strongly connected to the agricultural sector. Since 1990, the EU has been able to decrease its territorial emissions with almost 30%. Yet this reduction doesn't capture the full environmental footprint of the EU, which extends beyond its borders due to the import of emission intensive goods and services to satisfy EU demand. And since 1990, the global emission levels, CO2 emission levels, have increased with 63%. And according to IPCC and others, unsustainable consumption patterns are one of the main drivers behind the sustained global emission levels. Trade is a key building block of the EU fostering job opportunities, economic growth, and welfare. At the same time, unsustainable production and consumption patterns drive the emissions at the global level. And it's important that we understand and address also these emissions. Uh, so for those of you not very familiar with consumption-based emissions since before, I can mention that this then includes emissions from production, and imports embedded, so emissions embedded in imports minus our exports. This map visualizes the CO2 emissions embedded in EU trade. Most countries are on the red scale here, meaning that they are net importers of CO2 and that their imports contain more emissions than their exports. Whereas on the other hand then, Countries on the blue scale export more through their exports than what they import. And according to Eurostat, EU's consumption-based emissions were on average 15% higher than its territorial emissions in 2021. So this means that the emissions associated with goods and services imported for EU consumption exceed emissions associated with its exports signaling a growing adverse impact on, of EU consumption on third countries. More than 30% of these emissions uh, are imported from other countries, with the reminder being traded within EU borders, where the largest exporters of emissions to EU was the China, followed by Russia, United States and India. The EU has long prioritized signal or mitigating territorial emissions and most member countries, member states have clear ambitions and targets in place to address those. In 2021, the average footprint of the EU was eight tons per person, showing variation between around 4.5 and 11 tons, as you can see from this slide here. And note that this excludes emissions from public consumption and investments, which is typically also included in member states' uh, reports on consumption-based emissions. Uh, food was here the largest, or is here um, for the EU as a whole, the largest uh, uh, consumption category, uh, followed by housing and then mobility. Several positive measures have been taken at the EU level already that indirectly or directly uh, address consumption-based emissions. As part of our work, we have not been able to cover the full pol policy landscape as part of this project. So our mapping is not exclusive, but it, uh, but we can, yes, some of the measures uh, are listed on, on this slide here, where we mention uh, EU Green Deal, which is EU strategy to reach climate neutrality by 2030, and which includes initiatives such as the Fit for 55 package, which is a policy framework, which aims to reduce EU's emissions by 55% by 2030, et cetera. And we, we found that 
up to around 2018, most of the policy measures at EU level had a clear focus on waste management, energy efficiency and public procurement. But in recent years, we also note that the EU policy framework uh, for reducing emissions have broadened from regulating producers mainly to increasingly address consumption by targeting retailers and household related emissions by final consumers. And more recently, the policy scape has, scope has also reached beyond EU borders by requiring importers of goods and services to monitor and compensate for social and environmental impacts along the supply chain. The eighth environmental action program from 2022 is EU's common agenda for environmental policy until 2030. It complements the broader goals of the EU Green Deal and aims to speed up the transition to climate neutral and resource efficient economy, recognizing that human and well being and prosperity depend on healthy ecosystems. It also cites reducing material and consumption footprints among the enabling conditions for reaching these objectives. Could add that the midterm review of the Environmental Action Program from March this year suggested that while good progress in several areas have been recognized, a faster progress is needed to meet EU's 2030 target uh, and the 55% reduction and reach climate neutrality by 2050. There is strong scientific evidence for the viewpoint that meeting today's sustainability challenges will require a fundamental transformation of our societies and major uh, changes to current consumption practices. It is of course then not only greenhouse gas emissions we are concerned about, but also other environmental pressures associated with our consumption patterns, such as biodiversity loss and water scarcity. In the scientific literature, three types of sustainability strategies are often discussed, improved, shift, and avoid, where improved typically refers to improving production processes to mitigate less greenhouse gases, and shift refers to changing consumption practices by, for instance, switching from meat to fish or from an electric vehicle instead of a fossil fuel driven car. And lastly, avoid points to profound changes in consumption behavior needed by, for instance, vacationing at home instead of flying abroad for vacation. And all over the world, efforts have traditionally focused on energy efficiency measures, that is, the improve uh, category on this slide, which is considered a weak sustainability measure. Uh, sustainable consumption uh, or also these measures are of course very important, but they are often not enough for targeting the more profound behavioral uh, changes and changes in consumption patterns that are needed to mitigate the emissions we see at the global level. So with that, I hand over to Yindan to uh, take us through our findings from our case studies. So, yes. Um, as uh, my colleagues mentioned, uh, part of this report has also been to make a deep dive into three member states, Denmark, France, and Sweden. And these are three countries that have already taken several initiatives to mitigate consumption-based emissions. And by looking more closely into their approaches for addressing CBE, we hope to gain some insights on what other countries can do and what can be done at an EU level. And I would like to start by saying that all three countries, they use different methodologies for uh, monitoring and calculating uh, their consumption-based emissions. So the numbers that you see in these graphs are not comparable across countries or comparable to the EU statistics. But what we can do is to look at the development within each country and how they compare against each other. So the top graph to the right 
shows Sweden's consumption-based emissions over time. The middle one shows Denmark's and the bottom one shows France. And there's a lot of info uh, on this slide, but some main takeaway is that the general developments within each, within each country is that the consumption-based emissions have decreased over time with the exception around year 2020. But these developments also mask another trend where on one hand, we have reduced consumption-based emissions over time. On the other hand, we have an increased growing share of imported emissions uh, in each country. And if we look at the year of the latest available data in Sweden and Denmark, it's 2021. In France, it's estimates for 2022. We can see that imported emissions accounted for between 56 and 64% of the overall consumption-based emissions in these countries. So, uh, and if we look closer uh, on the imported emissions, we can see that European countries and Europe as a region is the main source of origin of the emissions that Sweden, Denmark, and France import, which could indicate that the EU can have an influence on the imported emissions uh, in these countries. And on a country level, China, um, Germany, Russia, United States, in no particular order here, they stand out as important trade partners for uh, our case study countries. None of the case study countries have targets in place for reducing consumption-based emissions, but they have all expressed intentions to enact such targets. But the level of progress varies between the countries. For example, Sweden, there was a proposal by a parliament committee to establish a net zero target for consumption-based emissions by 2045. The proposal had quite a broad political uh, support, but it was shelved in 2022 with a change of government. In Denmark, the Danish government is currently reviewing the economic implications of setting a consumption-based emissions target. And uh, France seems to have come the furthest towards setting a target with their coming third revision of the French national low, co low carbon strategy. And that's a legally binding roadmap that steers France's climate policy. Uh, it's subject to a revision every five years. It's The next revision is under development now and will include indicative carbon footprint budgets for consecutive five-year periods. Each country also has a set of policies in place that are relevant for households' consumption-based emissions. And of course, there are many more than in this table, but this is just to show some examples. For example, in Sweden, we have a reduced VAT on repairments of bikes, shoes, clothing, and textiles. In Denmark, there is a boiler scrapping scheme for more energy-efficient housing. And in France, uh, public and private catering firms must offer 50% of their food products with a sustainability certification. And the case studies also involved interviews with experts from each country to gain insights on the opportunities and barriers related to addressing consumption-based emission. One of the common theme raised in the expert interviews was that was the challenges related to behavioral change that is needed for addressing consumption-based emissions. So enforcing a shift towards sustainable consumption practices is considered politically sensitive because such policies may be perceived as moralizing or intruding on people's private spheres. The interviewees also see that the progress on mitigating consumption-based emissions seems to be stuck at the national level, and they uh, want governments to prioritize CBE at the national level, where ambitions are currently lagging, according to them. There are also some suggestions on how to go forward for example, in France, uh, they suggest supply side measures to kind of overcome the political sensitivities by indirectly influencing consumer demand. And in Denmark, where there is a quite high public awareness and acceptance that behavior needs to change, um, the interviewee suggested uh, raising public awareness on what a so-called good life means and the link between sufficiency and an improved well-being. 
there was a broad agreement amongst the interviewees that uh, the EU is the most effective level on which to make progress on consumption-based emissions. And they welcome top-down measures to kind of push member states to act and also provide guidance on where to where they should direct their efforts as the topic of consumption is, is quite broad. There was also a broad agreement that uh, EU level monitoring of consumption-based emissions is important for bringing transparency, consistency, accountability, um, but it's also quite complex to develop a, a standardized or harmonized method for monitoring these. Uh, for example, each of the case study countries they use different methodologies in their monitoring, and there's also no clear choice of, of what method to use. For example, the French interviewees uh, prefer the Figaro tool, which is the EU reference tool for policymakers. And they prefer it because it's robust in terms of funding and updates, uh, something that the Swedish and Danish interviewees also recognize. Exobase is another tool that uh, Sweden and Denmark currently uses. It was developed as a research initiative in the beginning. And, um, it's considered more comprehensive than Figaro, but at the same time, it also has many estimates and a lot of data seems to be outdated. Many of the interviewees see that the lack of international standards, that itself is a barrier towards establishing formal networks and partnerships between countries. And having monitoring standards in the EU could also make the EU more attractive as a trade partner especially for the countries that already use low emission production practices uh, for their products and services. And with that, I hand over back to you, Katarina, for conclusions and recommendations. Thank you, Linda. Yes, so in conclusion then, and reflecting on the challenges and barriers for a start, we we know there is a large dependency on imported emissions to sustain EU's consumption demand. The consumption levels across the member states are uneven, ranging between 11 and 4.6 tons, raising questions about equity and, and fairness there appears to be limited political support for more stronger policy measures to address consumption-based emissions at the national level. And there is often a lack of necessary resources, knowledge, et cetera, and tools to monitor and address consumption-based emissions. And as we've heard, uh, the available methods for calculating and monitoring the climate impact of consumption at the EU level are currently inadequate. They do not include the full set of greenhouse gases. Some consumption categories are often missing, such as long range air travel and investments. There is uh, limited insights into the supply chains, etc. And also at the EU level, there are limited insights available to to understand more about the public consumption pressures. And we've found that EU and member state policies show an emphasis on uh, efficiency gains. Uh, there are still quite limited examples of policies promoting sort of more stronger measures, supporting more profound changes in consumption behavior and uh, yeah, there seems to be an emphasis on improvements, which is important, but not sufficient. Looking at the opportunities then, uh, we know there is a strong willingness to address consumption-based emissions at the member state level, despite being hindered by political will and lack of resources in many cases. There are several examples from member states to learn from and opportunities to build on their work to establish collaboration and learning platforms. 
And we also see that there are uh, good opportunities to expand on some of the current policy measures at the EU level to cover additional sectors and programs products as well as targeting consumption behaviors more effectively. There is also an opportunity for the EU to support national action by establishing consumption-based targets at the EU level and put in place standardized monitoring practices to help influence political agendas at the national level. And then lastly, we, we see opportunities for tackling the climate uh, change, climate crisis at the global level uh, uh, through collaborative efforts. And we see major opportunities for EU here to take a lead in shaping the international norms and standards, driving collective responses to climate, the climate crisis and setting examples for other nations to follow. So moving over to our recommendations, in the report we put forward 24 recommendations. We only we will only go through a few of these here. So again, then the first one is about uh, establishing a standardized approach to consumption-based emission for counting and monitoring to complement or to ensure consistency in data collection and enable comparison between member states to better track progress, to set mandatory annual reporting requirements for consumption-based emissions on the member states, to complement existing reporting and territorial emissions, to establish short and long-term targets at the EU level for consumption-based emissions, complementary to targets on territorial emissions. This would be, we think, very important for supporting more progressive action to address consumption-based emissions at the member state level. And then also improve data quality and extend data coverage at the EU level to also increase the supply chain transparency. To advance EU's work to address consumption-based emissions and help overcome political sensitivities at the national level, we recommend to make efforts to expand on existing policy frameworks to ensure consumption-based emissions are covered more broadly, and to design policies and measures at both member state and EU level to focus more on promoting also so-called strong sustainability and consumption sufficiency emphasizing not only shifts or efficiency gains in consumption, but also the importance of consuming less overall. And then also to create a space for member states to learn, share best practices and help improve national policy frameworks and, and measures. And then lastly, on trade and transparency, uh, we recommend the EU to continue working strongly with fostering trade partnerships around production practices and low carbon technologies and create a more level playing field for carbon pricing policies and promote transparency in supply chain. We also recommend that the EU work to position itself as a global leader in the fight against climate change by addressing consumption-based emissions more strongly, setting examples for other nations to follow and making the EU a more attractive trade partner. This can then become a key moment for the EU to drive change and leverage this influence on the global stage. Thank you. Back to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Katharina and Ian Dunn, for presenting the report. Uh, it's a lot of hard work that's gone into that, and uh, very nice to have the clear recommendations at the conclusion. Uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce our panel.
And uh, each panelist uh, here on the screen uh, will have up to five minutes to bring their own perspective on the challenges and opportunities for addressing consumption-based emissions. So I would like to begin with uh, Per Holmgren, who is a member of Parliament uh, at the European Parliament representing the Greens European Free Alliance. Uh, he has a background in meteorology and climate science. MEP Holmgren served in the previous parliament and was a member of the ENVI committee and will now join the new parliament following the elections. So can I start by congratulating you, uh, Pair, on successful election results. Over to you. Thank you very much, Timothy, and thank you for inviting me, of course, and, and a huge thanks to Katerina and, and Jinda and everyone else involved in this uh, very, very important uh, report. I won't uh, make some, some huge analysis of the elections, but uh, I mean, I think it's obvious to, to each and one of us that this new forthcoming uh, new parliament and also the upcoming commission is likely to have an even stronger push uh, during these issues than the last one. So it's really good that this report is launched now and, and don't stop sharing it and, and uh, reminding of its uh, findings. Uh, and the recommendations presented are, are clearly needed and also important, they are, it is possible to implement them. And uh, as you probably know, we have discussed them in this house now and then, ongoing discussions, but we haven't gotten far enough at all for actually putting them to practice. And once again, uh, there is a clear risk that the uh, ingoing parliament and the next um, commission will have at least slightly lower ambitions to do this. But um, I'm still hoping that me and, and others more uh, progressive will have an impact and the possibility to, to, to raise the ambitions and, and include this. And, uh, it, it also, I mean, it, it's important to realize that the environmental impacts of, of uh, uh, EU consumptions uh, are projected to rise up to, to 2030. So it's clear that we need more measures. And, and once again, this report is uh, very, very uh, timely and, and, and welcome. Um, to me, it's clear that we need to do a number of things. Um, uh, I would like to, to list four of them. Uh, first of all, finally set common targets for consumption-based emissions. Uh, secondly, standardize and make mandatory monitoring, accounting and reporting CVEs. And then, of course, increase transparency in the global supply chains of our consumptions. This will be very important to, you know, track the full impact of, of our uh, consumption all the way back to, to uh, wherever the material starts to, to be produced. And then also uh, coordinate our efforts at the EU level and, and support each other as well as developing countries in transitioning to, to better production methods. Uh, and once again, um, uh, I really think this um, report um, uh, helpfully highlights uh, the difference when we talk about addressing consumption-based emissions between the weak sustainability and the strong sustainability, as Katerina pointed out very, very clearly. Um, I mean, the, with the weak sustainability then, usually being improved consumption uh, with measures for, for not the least efficiency gains of different matter. Uh, whereas the strong sustainability measures uh, being focused on, on shifting or ideally even avoiding consumption. And that is, of course, reducing consumption altogether. Um, this will probably be a huge discussion, as we know that uh, a lot of the political groups now are starting to, to say, yes, we do need to have high ambitions on climate, but they mustn't uh, lead to a, a degrowth of the total economy, etc. We, we need to combine the 
climate ambitions with clear targets for, for uh, having some sort of uh, green growth or whatever you should call it. And uh, I think that will be one of the main uh, huge debates regarding these questions uh, during the, the next uh, five years. Now, uh, the European, as I mentioned, the European Parliament has uh, now and then discussed these uh, issues already and, and called for binding consumption footprints. Uh, most significantly, I would say, uh, is, uh, as you mentioned, in the eighth environmental action program, which I myself was involved in negotiation. Uh, but it's really, really high time now that we actually follow up on these calls with both binding targets. Uh, and for me personally, as you mentioned, Timothy, in, in the introduction, I'm, my background is meteorologist and, and climate expert. Uh, and before I joined uh, my political party, which is just a little bit more than five years ago, I, I didn't really um, understood how huge impact we could have uh, through our trade agreements. Uh, I mean, if we would really use our trade agreements for, for sustainability and, and also, of course, for, for human rights, we could really create an impact, a global impact. And one of the best examples uh, during the last period, uh, I think, was the CBAM, the, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism in, in, in the Fit for 55 package. But if we could think in a similar way in, in all the, the trade agreements, I, I really think that uh, the EU could have an impact uh, on a global scale. And um, I mean, in the global climate crisis, uh, personally, I think this is one of the most important ways for the EU to really show leadership and have this important impact on a global level that we should have and that uh, Ursula von Leyen often liked to talk about during the last mandate. Now we will see if she will be re-elected. I, I, I would guess so, uh, but I'm not really sure that the incoming commission will have uh, as high ambitions as uh, the previous one, but I hope they will. I'm sure that we in, in the Green Group will have at least as high ambitions as we had during the last period, uh, anyhow. Uh, unfortunately, I need to leave at 11, but I think, Timothy, that you wanted to, to uh, have some uh, follow-up question to me right away. Yes, uh, if I may. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Per. It, the, the, it is a quick question about uh, behavioral change. You pointed to uh, the importance of turning this into practice. I wonder if you have any insights from your uh, discussions with uh, people and communities re regarding the uh, need to, to change in behavior that uh, could be necessary for uh, changing consumption patterns overall. So you mentioned the policy side. I wonder if there's also on the uh, community side. Well, for me personally, I think uh, some of these things will, will be handled the, the hard way, so to say. I mean, we live on a planet with uh, uh, with, with finite resources. Uh, we, we've been talking a lot about circular economy, but I also think that we will uh, be forced in, into a economy where we uh, share uh, a lot of things, carpools being maybe the most important and, and obvious thing uh, to... to um, really make sure that we we decrease the total amount of consumption on an individual basis but maybe then increase the consumption on a more um, collective basis and need and, and learn to to share that sort of consumption so in the end we will need a lot of less uh, material and resources to, to keep our society going. And I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, actors out there in the society 
that really want to see this transition as well. But we'll see if it will happen already during this next five years. Uh, uh, otherwise, I think we will see that sort of change sometime during the next decade, quite rapidly, actually. Thank you so much, Per, for uh, taking the time. And I understand you're, you're busy and have to leave. Uh, we will have a number of other panelists to speak and uh, hopefully a chance for you to listen in uh, as we go. Uh, so yeah, thank I'll you. stay until 11. Thank you very much once again. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So our next panelist is uh, Bente Halkia, who's uh, the vice chair of the Danish Council on Climate Change. And uh, the council has been active uh, proposing the Danish government implement uh, indicative benchmarks for reducing consumption-based emissions and also specific policy measures. Uh, so we very much look forward to hearing uh, your perspective, uh, Bente, on the, from the Danish context. Thank you very much, Timothy. And, uh, and thank you very much for inviting us uh, from the Danish Council on Climate Change to this uh, launch of this very important report. Um, we think it's an excellent report uh, with key takeaways, much in line with focal areas uh, of work on consumption-based emissions uh, reductions that we do in the Danish Council on Climate Change. And also the uh, selected recommendations highlighted here today, for instance, uh, to establish standardized approaches to um, CBEs, especially with regards to accounting and to monitoring and control, uh, and to establish mandatory annual reporting in member states. We are on our way to suggest that in Denmark, actually. Um, and to also, of course, try to create short and long-term targets or benchmarking or whatever can be possible uh, at the EU level. So. Uh, but I'd like to just highlight perhaps the main recommendations uh, from the uh, the Danish uh, Council on, on Climate Change. And just to set the scene, um, like uh, the, the excellent report did before, the Danish consumption-based emissions are approximately 50% higher than our territorial emissions. So um, the Danish consumption-based climate uh, footprint must be reduced. So the Council in Denmark recommends that Denmark establish a benchmark, exactly as you said, for Denmark's consumption-based climate footprint and the government's long-term global climate strategy. A benchmark in the global climate strategy is less binding than a target in the National Act, but it still provides political guidance. And we're on our way to discuss uh, how the different political targets and the climate policies can be negotiated within the next year or so. And it, there might be some chances there to get it in as well. So um, in uh, 2021, a Danish citizen emitted on average 11 tons of CO2 equivalents contributing to a total Danish consumption-based climate footprint of 63 million tons of CO2 emissions. So um, this Benchmark should be complemented by an additional benchmark for emissions resulting from public procurement. Public procurement is associated with a CO2 equivalent emissions of 16 million tons in Denmark. And this is exactly one of the things uh, we wanted to comment upon as well uh, to this excellent report, because uh, the last point of the report says, what are we missing? <laughs> and so one of the missing uh, highlighted things here is the public consumption. So looking at uh, at the public consumption as also as consumption, uh, we find very important in the Danish Council. And uh, some of the results from the uh, case studies uh, that Jindan uh, presented also headed into this direction. So um, to us, uh, this thing with the public consumption uh, points towards uh, both the shifting of consumption and also to the consuming less especially if you look at the food sector, uh, namely meat, of course, meat reduction and uh, and getting rid of uh, too much over meat consumption. And I noticed that in the case studies, you mentioned uh, the uh, public official Danish dietary advice. And um, I can clearly recognize that not too much is happening at the national level apart from that when we talk about this public procurement kind of uh, policy measure. but the public kitchens in many municipalities at the moment and regions are shifting 
towards following this uh, shifting the meals, actually the diets in the public kitchens serve both canteens and institutional kitchens, um, shift towards following this official dietary advice, which contains much less meat than previously. So this is towards a plant-rich diet. And this is part of an alliance, a national alliance between uh, most of the municipalities in Denmark on making local climate action plans. So as a part of that, uh, the change and the shift of uh, public procurement of meals uh, is changing and shifting towards uh, more plant-rich. So this is both shifting the public consumption, so that's consumption in itself that's being shifted, but it also helps normalize uh, plant-rich diets for households by creating what some other people call social tipping points. So that was just a, an extra kind of comment. I wanted to come in with the Danish experiences in relation to this. Uh, coming a little bit more back uh, to, to uh, some of the other things in the report, uh, we see currently the most promising policies and approaches to mitigate the CBEs are, first of all, EU's uh, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, the CBAM, uh, which could potentially, at least from 2026, prevent carbon leakage beyond the EU. So uh, the CBAM will ensure the carbon price of imports is equivalent to the carbon price of domestic production, and that the EU's climate objectives in this manner are not um, undermined, hopefully. The second thing is EU's second emission trading systems, which from 2027, We'll put a quota on emissions from road transport and heating of buildings. So a particular Danish thing, perhaps, is also that the effect on our national climate footprint from import and thus consumption based emission from import of biomass for bioenergy is not included in our national CO2 report. So the reduction in the Danish territorial emissions is primarily due to reductions in the energy sector as it is. But however, a large part of these reductions from the energy sector is explained by an increase in the demand and the import of bioenergy. So burning biomass does not have an does have an effect uh, on the climate, although this is then accounted for in the countries harvesting the biomass. But Denmark does not have control with the management of emissions in the Lulucef uh, sector in the country from where we import the biomass. So that underlines the necessity of one of the main recommendations or the selected recommendations today. Um, of establishing st uh, standardized approaches to the accounting and especially the monitoring. This is why we don't uh, suggest a target decidedly in Denmark, but a benchmark, because the control, the monitoring uh, element uh, is, is difficult to, uh, to manage. So that's all from Denmark now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bente. Um, now we'll move along uh, so that we uh, can hear from the French perspective, uh, Michel Colombier, who serves on the French High Council on Climate. The High Council has recommended the reduction of French carbon footprint to be consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Uh, Michel was also a contributor to the report tackling France's footprint uh, through the Council. So we're very much looking forward to hearing your perspective. Welcome, Michel. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. And thank, thank you very much for inviting us for the, the launch of this report. Um, well, the, the, the report is extremely rich and exhaustive. And I think that we are pretty much aligned on both the analysis that you make in the report, uh, uh, that is uh, quite similar to the analysis that we've published in 2022 regarding France. And also, and importantly, uh, regarding the conclusions and recommendations that you that you make, um, obviously there, there's a lot of technicality in this in this discussion, and I think that in five minutes it's not the right place and the right moment to discuss all the technicalities. And I will just stress a few uh, questions uh, that for us seem important. The, the first one. Um, I think it's important you you had uh, MEPs in the before me speaking. It's really important that you stress in this report the European dimension of the discussion. Uh, we've started doing this in France because there was a political concern about the issue, but I think that it's really at the EU level that we can uh, correctly tackle the the, the, the question. If, and we've shown and you've shown in the analysis that um, internal EU trade is also important. 
And we could say that, well, uh, there's no leakage within the EU anyway, because it's accounted in the, the emissions of the of the other country, Germany, for instance, uh, when we exchange between France and Germany. Um, but we will see with the measures that it's a different way of uh, discussing what we can do and influence uh, others. So even within the EU, I think it's important. Th th there's one point. I think your, your report is broader uh, than the report we issued in 22 and you, that you mentioned, because you really stress two different discussions that are uh, that are clearly connected, but that are different. One is the necessity to sh to change consumption patterns. Um, so the, the discussion on uh, decoupling within the weak and the strong uh, capacity to uh, to really reduce CO2 emissions and go uh, to neutrality, and the necessity to to really address consumption patterns and have specific policies that economists would say they are not necessary because uh, eventually with uh, with prices etc things would adjust but we know we don't have time we know uh, societies are complex and we need to intervene we need policies to try to influence shift uh, avoid consumption patterns and the second question, is, and, and this is true even if we had just one global country, it's, it's, it's the question on how we change globally uh, the relationship between consumption and production. And even with one country at the global level, it would still be true. We need, I think, these consumption uh, measures. And we, we, we have also issued report on this question with the, the HCC. And the second question is, we live in a fragmented world and addressing consumption-based question is a very efficient way and is a different way of discussing at international level, of influencing at international level our patterns, obviously, and the transition and changes in other parts of the world. And so I think these two dimensions are extremely important. The supply demand dimension, that is, that is true anyway, and the internal, external, international discussion that is important. So a couple of words on both dimensions. On the dimension of um, decoupling and um, the change of uh, patterns, consumption patterns, I think it's important that we stress at French level and importantly after the convention, the citizen convention that we, that, that we had uh, just before the law that you mentioned, that the question is not just to change behavior because behavior is a very individual dimension. And de facto consumption is not just an individual decision process. Consumption is extremely driven by collective organization from both private and public side. It's important that in consumption, we understand that it is also about belonging to communities. It's also about some sort of mimetism sometimes. It's also about the possibilities I have to change, to shift, to reduce, etc., that are different from one people to the other, according to the environment where people live. And so there's an important in, uh, collective dimension in the, the, this discussion. I think it's important if we want at EU level to really go for uh, this discussion on, on, on uh, consumption patterns, to avoid a discussion just on behavior and individual responsibility. At international level, I think it's important, and I've seen that there are questions on the um, uh, on the discussion uh, about this. The, 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 the interesting dimension, I think, is that uh, it brings a different avenue for international discussion on how to reduce emissions. Because it brings an avenue through consumption of influencing other countries, but also influencing through private partners influencing through domestic policies on consumption patterns, on responsibility of firms, responsibility of importers, and the possibility to open dialogues at both public level between nations at international level, but also between private partners being influenced by domestic policies to try to influence what's happening in other countries. And there, I think, for the EU, it's important to understand that we cannot just say that we want to be exemplar, uh, but we need to be collaborative. This is extremely important. Um, maybe I don't have time now to uh, to go further into detail, but there's a lot of approaches 
that need to be collaborative approaches with the rest of the world if we want to embark the rest of the world in the transition that we are trying to uh, achieve within the Europe. And I think I'm already more than five minutes, so I will stop here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michel. Uh, uh, very uh, clear. And uh, we will now move to our final panelist, and that's Ulla <laughs> Altero, is the chief executive of the Swedish Climate Policy Council. And the Climate Policy Council has, uh, in its annual reports, been consistently highlighting consumption-based emissions and the need for policies that uh, target shifts. And uh, I think that it would be very interesting to hear from Ulla uh, from the perspective of the Council and Sweden. So welcome. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation and to be part of this very interesting discussions. And also, let me also congratulate on, the, as Michelle stated, a very rich report. And there's a lot of uh, things there that, that I think will be useful for us and, and many in this discussion. So that, that's really great. The, the Swedish Policy Council's, our main task is to, to elevate the overall policy of the government in relation to the climate goals set by government and parliament, which means that our focus naturally is on, on the the territorial emissions, that is how, how those targets are constructed, both on national and EU level. And the Council as such, we have done less work on these issues than, than for example, the French and the Danish Council that you just heard. So just to point out that my comments now will be some more personal reflections on, on, your, on your report. But the, we, we do have, I mean, the Swedish Council do, as you mentioned, Tim, we have of course, still made the point that the consumption perspective is, is still very important. And we have told, recommended the Swedish government that they need to increase uh, focus on, on that kind of, of policy instruments. And, and that policy today is too supply oriented. Uh, there is less to little efforts on, on the both energy and material um, efficiency and, and, and circular uh, approaches, the behavioral aspects of, of, of um, the climate transition is, is policies is even in a way shunned away from those perspectives. But I think it's, I mean, for good, it's mentioned in the report that for a long time, the, the governments have prioritized the territorial the greenhouse uh, emissions. And I think still it must be said that that's for good reason. That is how the Paris Agreement is, is constructed, and that is what, what countries and national governments can control and be responsible for. Uh, just, just to have that, that said. Uh, but in basically, I think I also would agree to if most or all the recommendations as, as put forward this morning, at least, uh, like at, at Katarina earlier. Um, and especially those on, on uh, increasing uh, the, the data and the way of accounting for, for consumption-based emissions and making it much better and even uh, b basis for, the, for this discussion. I do have some doubts maybe that the I mean, binding quantitative targets uh, is a, a very constructive way forward. Uh, I would certainly say that Overall, uh, ambitions like reducing the global impact, of course, should should guide policy. But taking into account the lack of data and the, the, the all the the difficulties there, I'm not convinced that that uh, binding targets for consumption-based emissions, given that also that input perspective is, would take us very far. And and there is also of course a risk that you could kind of uh, diffuse the responsibility for the, the hardcore territorial emissions. Uh, I also noticed that the report only covers household consumptions, and I it's understandable, as, as mentioned, I think, the lack of data, and you might have done other reports on public procurement, so on. Still, I think it's... it's, um, it's important to, to see the full, full, full picture in Sweden, I think con household consumption is only 60% of the total consumption. And investments in general are more carbon intense. 
and it's not only that uh, in in the in the short run it's also that investments tend to lock us into fossil based uh, systems for maybe for decades so i would say that that the the um, investments perspective is is really important and maybe that could be a focus for another report and as already mentioned, then public procurement is also that one is, is a large part of the whole picture. And second, it much more in the control of, of policies and, and governments. And so they should be much more responsible. And then my final point on this is, I think Michelle was, was commenting on it already, that there might be a risk that focusing too much on individual behavior put kind of a... <laughs> moral burden that is is not uh, inappropriate on 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 the on the citizens and i think there is yeah as already mentioned by michelle there are collective organizations and perspectives on that as well and still policy is important and i think that's one of the good things that with the report that it it lists a lot of policies that that kind of doesn't put the burden just on the individual consumer but but what what we can do as as citizens also in the role of decisions making at work or or as as voters or or in much other roles than consumers uh, i think one good a good news maybe is if i understand the figures right that 70% of of um, consumption based emissions in the eu countries are actually originating from within the European Union, <clears throat> which means that, <clears throat> that our European, our common policies and the ETS and the ETS2 that is coming and actually cover a large part of also the consumer-based emissions, which, yeah, I think is encouraging in a way that we can deal with it within the, the collaboration we do have in the, in the European Union. Uh, Maybe just finally, one or two comments, and I think more or less on a kind of a narrative in, in the report. It it makes the point at some somewhere that since 2015, the European Union has become a net importer of CO2 emissions, meaning that the emissions <clears throat> associated with our imports exceeds the emissions connected to our exports. And then makes the point that that signals a growing um, <clears throat> adverse impact of EU consumptions on other nations. I'm not sure that I agree with that. <clears throat> I think in in absolute terms, I think the figures tells us that that we actually the consumption based emissions imported ones have decreased. And I I wonder if that relation is even even even. Um, uh, if that is is uh, I'd say rational uh, relation. Uh, for example, if Swedish industries now some of them turning inv investing heavily in fossil free processes, for example, fossil free steel making, it will reduce uh, Swedish CO two exports dramatically in a few years. And I hard to see that that will make that would be something negative. Even if the relative, uh, the relative uh, relatives will change, so that that the the our CO two import emissions will be much higher, I would be much much more worried if it was that Europe exported a lot of dirty industries to the rest of the world. So I think that is a kind of a, a an approach that I'm not really follow. And then finally. Uh, when it comes to also import the emissions, I think I agree basically with with Point Spade Michelle that I think collaborative approaches are are crucial in this area. Not at all being an expert on this, and I have some doubts that the report put some emphasis on on expanded CBAM to products, industry products, and so on. And I I'm not convinced that that is a very uh, either say a, a road that takes us to a more fair transition and i i doubt that it's practically implementable in in in, in for, for many reasons 
And then my final little point is maybe also on a narrative of, on the, I'm fully agree that we need to move from improve to more shift of consumption, and maybe even avoid consumption, even if that is a bit more difficult to get what it exactly means. And the report says, ideally, we would need more of avoid, uh, to avoid consumption. I think that would need to be maybe also another report, but to elaborate some more on that, what does it really mean? And what does it mean from a policy uh, perspective? Uh, I, I, it, it, it's a bit hard for me to see exactly how the report builds to that, that conclusion. So thanks a lot, there were some, some comments and uh, thanks again for a very impressive and, and rich report, which I think will benefit us all a lot. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ulla, and thank you very much to all panelists for a really well thought out and uh, helpful and insightful remarks, I think, which uh, not only will be useful for this discussion, but also help us uh, take uh, uh, our research further in this area. And in particular, um, one point was uh, about the uh, household focus of the report, and which um, is one example in Sweden is 60%. Uh, there is also the public uh, consumption as well as investments, which are uh, important topics. And in the chat, uh, there is a, a link to a previous report on green public procurement, which covers case studies from a number of different member states. Um, and uh, the investments is also a, a very important ongoing uh, research topic. Um, I, I think uh, what uh, I'd like to uh, start with, uh, we have a number of questions that have come through uh, into the Q&A from participants. Thank you very much. And, and we'll uh, endeavor to get to those either in the discussion or uh, by responding directly. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, give uh, the report authors uh, that are represented here in the, the panel, uh, Katharina Axelson and uh, Jin Dan Gong, uh, a chance to uh, reflect on any uh, comments that the panelists have raised during this last session. And I'm also pleased to say that um, Cesar Dugas is uh, one of the uh, contributors to the report, uh, who uh, has also joined us in this panel discussion. Uh, so uh, let me welcome Cesar. Uh, let me uh, hand first to uh, Katarina. Thanks, Tim. Thank uh, sorry, um, uh, Cesar, would you like to introduce yourself uh, first? Uh, I didn't uh, give you the opportunity yet, so. Sure. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Cesar Dugast from Carbon4, uh, which is a French consultancy specialized in climate change. And I'm happy to be here as part of uh, a co-author of the report because I was in charge with my colleague Pierre of the French case study. And uh, hi, everyone, and happy to participate. Wonderful. Uh, now, let me ask uh, Katharina if you would like to reflect on uh, briefly on any comments that came up during the panel discussion, and then we'll uh, begin to tackle some of the very good questions that have come through in our Q&A. Thank you, Tim. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, yeah, I was uh, keen to respond to Ola's comments there about whether 30% is, is a lot or, or a little. Or uh, so by by first emphasizing that uh, those figures, of course, refer to carbon dioxide emissions only, and not the full greenhouse gas emissions, where we miss out on about thirty percent of the, the total sort of consumption pressure with methane and, and uh, carbon uh, dioxide uh, being missed out. On uh, many so gases strongly related to the agriculture sector. Uh, a lot part of that is being imported. We are also missing out on air, air travel impacts, for instance. And as you also pointed there, we understand sort of investments are also missing and many other sort of consumption categories. So the figures we are able to present for you today are unfortunately not giving sort of the full picture. We understand a lot of uh, data is missing from this, but this 
was what is now available for us at the EU level. And then, of course, I think it's important to also understand that uh, greenhouse gas emissions are only one of many indicators that are important for us to, to monitor, to understand the full sort of consumption pressure associated with everything that we, we consume within the EU. So I do think uh, that it is very important to sort of continue to working on mitigating the emissions associated with imports sort of within the EU as well as from the outside of the EU. Uh, so, yeah, but it is, I agree with you that it is encouraging that emissions have been decreasing uh, lately, which is uh, good to see, but we also have noted that consumption-based emission projections are uh, uh, expecting in them to increase over the years up to 2030. We we hope that will not be the case, but but projections made at the EU level point in in this direction. So yes, I think I'll stop there. But uh, welcome any additional input also from other panelists or speakers on this topic. Uh, thank you, Katarina. Um, now, I wanted to, uh, there will be questions and opportunities for others to uh, respond to uh, to a number of uh, topics that have come up in the chat. I wanted to start with uh, one question, which is uh, for all uh, panelists. And uh, we this is uh, by Yunus Alarouk, and uh, he has said, what is the most efficient policy or policies to address consumption-based emissions? And uh, now we've talked about uh, the idea of uh, targets and benchmarks. Uh, we've also talked about the different uh, uh, areas of responsibility for emissions, whether they be uh, for households, public consumption, or uh, investments, uh, and, and also uh, how to shift those. Uh, I wonder if I could open up to the uh, our panelists, uh, and we, uh, Per Holmgren has, uh, uh, had to leave for another meeting, uh, but we still have, uh, of course, uh, Michel uh, from the uh, French High Council, uh, Bente from the Danish Climate Council, and uh, Ulla from the uh, Swedish uh, Climate Policy Council. So if I could ask you each uh, to remark on, on that question, uh, in your view, the, the most efficient policy or policies to address consumption-based emissions. Um, to keep in time, I think we'll have to have this as a very short uh, response, and then uh, so we can get to other questions. Uh, can I start? Uh, we'll go alphabetical order. Ben, please. Yep. If I have to choose, and uh, I cannot choose the benchmarking, <laughs> which we have already uh, seemed to be uh, quite uh, agreeing upon. I'd like to uh, say actually uh, supporting that the public procurement uh, is, uh, is being kind of more coordinated and organized uh, because uh, that definitely has something for it, which changes uh, behavior in a quite different manner than the individual behavior approach. Thank you very much. Um, and, and can I ask you just to briefly explain the benchmarks compared to targets, uh, the differences there? Uh, yes, of course. The reason why we uh, in the Danish Council says um, say uh, say benchmarking rather than than goal is that uh, that it's too difficult at the moment because of lack of systematic approaches to how to account and monitor to actually then control whether a target has been reached um, in a sufficiently a systematic manner. So uh, so that's and I think we actually have the idea from Sweden to be honest. So. <laughs> yes, so thank you. That's the difference uh, for us between uh, a goal and a benchmark. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and so benchmarks and public procurement. Uh, your turn, Michelle. Uh, what would you suggest uh, is the uh, most... What, you can take one or two if they're brief. Yes, thank you. Um, well, for, first, I think I, I would support the, 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 the previous two that were, that were chosen by, by Bente and... Uh, 
De, de facto, in France, we suggested that we, we, we should have a, a pathway which is something closer to the benchmark somehow. I mean, it's not binding, but it's, uh, it's just a way to say we need really to measure uh, and to discuss any type of policy against this uh, willingness of reducing. Um, I, I think I will go for the international angle. Um, because um, th th there's th there's a discussion that is um, that we are starting now uh, that is a very complicated discussion, which is the relationship between this approach, consumption based, and the Paris Agreement. And I think it's fully aligned with the idea of the Paris Agreement because basically the Paris Agreement is um, is born within within the EU within the the UN. This is, this is why we have a national accounting and national responsibility. But it's clear also that the Paris Agreement clearly recognizes that the governance of the transition is a complex governance with a lot of actors, and that one of the responsibility of governments is not just to change their national territorial emissions, but to find ways to collaborate, cooperate, and influence each other and influence also the private sector so we collectively collectively reach the goals. And this is extremely important. It was part also of the global stock take analysis that we, we, we need to think about what it collectively takes to reach that goal. And it's not just each, it's not it's not just a pledge and review agreement. It's much more than a pledge and review agreement. And so I think that this um, this consumption-based approach is a very effective way of discussing on a better political basis the influence of trade and the influence we can have with other partners by better collaborating. And that's that's one of the limits also of the CBAM because the CBAM is very unilateral in the design and in the way we've implemented the CBAM. And second, there's one question about the CBAM, which is, if you go down downwards to more complex goods, which is precisely the complexity of benchmark and 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 what what it takes and the legal at, at one time the the legal basis of such an approach, and so it's not to say okay, CBAM is not effective. Maybe it can be on steel, etc. But for what we are discussing here, we need, I think, different approaches and. Consumption-based approaches are a way to also discuss a level playing field through trade agreements, through the way we work with the private sector. We also regulate our private sector because our private sector is not territorial, is going beyond borders. And so this is, this is, I think, a very important avenue. And it's a mix of domestic public measures and private influence and diplomacy. And I think it's by building on the three pillars that we can really use consumption-based agreements, not just to change consumption patterns, which is extremely important, but also to have a better and more uh, active influence on behavior of the rest of the world, our trade partners. Uh, and, and to me, this is an extremely important point and important value added of this type of policies. And, and just one, just one point, maybe, uh, which is um, uh, I, I would not put exactly in the same package something that you've put in the same package in the report, which is uh, everything that connects to upstream taxation of of, uh, of energy, uh, because th th this is something similar to what California is doing, which is what is uh, being designed in the ETS two. Uh, it's important, but I think it's a different discussion. And, and there, it's an economic instrument that works well. It works in California, and we can we can implement it. It's a it's a tax uh, tax uh, uh, permit uh, mix of tax permit approach for consumers. But I, I think it's a completely different um, mm. different package, and it doesn't raise the same the same questions. Okay, thank you very much, Michel. So uh, clearly on the international side and looking towards a collective uh, rather than unilateral approach to cooperation. Um, and, and maybe just one thing, I, I want to support strongly what have been said by others, the necessity, I think, to measure this uh, consumption-based uh, element, not in percentage, not against import, against export, etc., but in absolute terms, 
because the reasons one evolved and the other evolved in a different di direction are completely different. And so when we make percentage uh, percentage of the global emissions of the country and we have different levels of countries, etc., we we are at risk of having the wrong conclusions. So I think it's very important to have absolute values and look at the evolution of absolute values and the evolution is more important than the, than the level. Thank you. Um, now I'll turn to Ulla. Uh, would you like to uh, second any of the ideas that have come up so far or perhaps uh, add uh, some of your own? Yeah, I would agree fully with Bente. And uh, thank you, Michelle, for elaborating on this relation between Paris and, and consumption-based emissions and the international perspective. I, 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 uh, I, would, I, I follow you on that as well. I agree to that. If I should, could just add something quickly, I think uh, a lot of things we're doing in the concept on circular economy, or which is not just products or, or improvements, but changing actually uh, products to services. And th there is a lot there that is important, I think. And then if I should single out some sector, I think the food system in general or, or it is, is an area also where technical solutions are. There are obvious limitations to, to kind of a technical approach to it. And where I think, uh, yeah, that, that's an area where, where a strong intersection of consumption and and uh, production, where, which is uh, also, I think, is important to deal with in a wise way. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much. Now, um, for a, a last question to the panelists, I'd like to uh, highlight, well, taking a, a bit of a cue, actually, from the international discussion here, um, and there's a question in the Q&A from Andrew Child from the European Climate Foundation, and uh, this is, in what sense would a focus on consumption emissions help the EU become a more attractive uh, partner? And I think uh, this is about the uh, global uh, influence of EU in, in the way that it uh, uh, positions itself in, in trade. And uh, I wonder if uh, the panelists would have uh, a response to uh, to that idea uh, that that uh, consumption emissions, if they are uh, lower in Europe, uh, it could be a more attractive uh, partnership for trade. Uh, again, uh, starting with uh, Bente. Mm. Trade agreements and trade relations is not my uh, speciality. I think somebody else will probably have a much better answer than I have. So, but of course, <clears throat> I mean, again, um, the, coming back to the point about uh, regulating this is probably one of the most important things to do. So in order to, uh, to achieve this at the EU level. Okay, thank you. Would uh, either Ulla or Michelle like to respond to that? Trade-related questions. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, well, it's not, it's not an easy question because obviously there's no magic that that just because we would have stronger, uh, stricter rules and norms, etc., uh, we would become a more attractive partner. Um, but at the same time, uh, I can see a couple of examples. Um, we, 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 we have a discussion now uh, with China on two important points that, that can be difficulties, but that where we can also find uh, ways of collaborative perspectives, which are on the one hand renewables and that's the second hand uh, cars and electric cars. Um, and and we see that there are uh, that there are different approaches. You can just uh, close doors to the, the import of uh, Chinese electric cars, which is the the, the U.S. approach. Um, you can be naive and say, okay, uh, we need those cars, etc. Uh, and uh, you can try to say that CBAM would protect us from from Chinese cars or whatever, which is not the case. Or you can really embrace what 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 is the difficulty and what is the strategic necessity for our car industry to develop in that field and for our battery industry to develop in that field, and in that case there are options 
of uh, collaborative approaches with uh, Chinese industrials that are more serious and more resilient than just closing doors or just letting everything uh, come in without any uh, regulation. So it means that it's the first, it's um, something that, that, that means that we need a strategy and a serious strategy and not just a couple of sympathetic ideas that we are the, the best of the world and, uh, and others will uh, follow. Um, but also that we have a power and we have the power of the, of the European market. And some of the graph in your report are graphs in dollars, but graphs in dollars and graphs in CO2 are extremely different. And so if we think about the, the, the two dimensions of trade, trade seen through CO2 impact and trade seen through monetary impact, you have a very different picture and it leaves room for interpretation, strategy, agreement, etc. Another example is we are discussing and we know that there are uh, important controversy about bilateral trade agreements and namely bilateral trade agreements on food and food is an important dimension of this transition on, say, behavior, but we, we had the discussion on what behavior means. Um, food is an important aspect. And for a number of countries that we have in front of us, the question is, to what extent we just want to protect ourselves from those countries saying, well, their production methods are not good and we, we are, well, I'm not sure we're doing better for the time being in Europe, but at least we want to transition in Europe, maybe. Or to what extent we develop trade agreements where the trade agreement is also a collaborative way of making the transition in our trade partners, with our trade partners, but in the country which, uh, with which we are, we are trading. And so if we connect, if we connect the, I would say the, 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 the cooperation, EU cooperation with the idea of agreement, and selective agreement, we can become de facto more attractive for certain countries because we connect a, an important political discussion, which is about trade, the role of trade in development also for southern countries, and our willingness to, uh, to make this transition. But we need to have the two agendas in uh, just one perspective. I, I think it's, uh, it could be easy to see the opposite. That uh, that others would look at Europe if we extensively use the standards and see see them and as as uh, unilaterally trying to dictate uh, the the kind of terms for trade protectionist with some maybe fair point and and kind of imposing European uh, standards on 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 the rest of the world and so on. That's why I think we need to be careful. It's not obvious that it will make us more attractive. But what I think, what I think, the most obvious thing is is to help other countries reduce their their territorial emissions or their production emissions, also, uh, and showing that we you can be competitive competitive in non fossil solutions, and that is something that obviously bring brings us forward, and also will then, uh, as a consequence, reduce our our uh, imported consumer based emissions. So yeah, I think this is an area where. Uh, once again, Michelle's approach there on collaboration is 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 crucial, and and also what we do once again, what we do in our on our own home turf on on giving good examples of things that works both for the climate and for the economy. Thank you very much, Ola, and thank you, Michelle, um, for for that point about uh, development cooperation uh, linked to to trade and. Uh, opportunities to address uh, those production side emissions as well, both by example, but also uh, with uh, with financial flows, essentially. Uh, now, uh, we have come to the conclusion now of our uh, webinar, and I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, thank our panelists uh, very much. Uh, thank you, Ulla, Bente, and Michelle, for your uh, insights throughout the discussion here. And uh, thank you very much to the report authors uh, for the presentation. Uh, now it's up to me to uh, wrap up this uh, webinar. And uh, so in doing so, I would also like to thank all of those who joined online and uh, posed such uh, stimulating questions that I'm glad we had the opportunity to pose uh, to the panelists and, and authors as well. 
Uh, time is always short, uh, but uh, it has been a really interesting discussion. And uh, we have uh, further uh, opportunities to engage with you, of course. Uh, if you uh, go to that link in the chat, you'll be able to see the report that was released today. And later in the day, uh, a policy brief will follow, uh, which is a, a more concise a summary of uh, some of the main findings and recommendations in the report. Uh, so with that, I uh, hereby close the webinar and thank you everyone for taking part. Thanks a lot.